your stuff. Yes. Where, where is your name? Yes, uh, the, okay, so here is the deal. As in the future, each one has 15 minutes, 30 minutes for yes. 3 minutes, I am nagging him to the stop. Okay, uh, so Sofia, watch that you can start. You should put your, your leg in much bigger leg than your collaborator. Yeah. Actually, your collaborator should be so small that nobody can read. <laughs> <laughs> but so many of them are here, so. <laughs> so even more. Yeah, so good morning, everybody. We will start with. Uh, I will talk about how uh, close the body rate we search with Alma, what we have done in cycle zero, and what we're planning to do in cycle one. Yes, that's working. Since it's early in the morning, I will start with uh, like an ABC to the AGV stars, repeating some of the things that we said yesterday about what is what is the important characteristic of AGV stars to, to help you follow why the results that are presented is important. Then I will talk about the um, other observations that we've done and that we're planning to do. I will show you some new results on the top low ratios of, of the CO. And finally, I will summarize. So, as we all know, AGV stars are the final nuclear burning stage of low to intermediate mass stars. And in this nuclear burning, they produce a lot of carbon, specifically 12 carbon, nitrogen, and also some heavier elements. And they produce a lot of dust. And it's the uh, radiation pressure on this dust uh, that causes them to have this intense winds, with the, which, which evolve along the AGV. Uh, leading to higher expansion velocities and reaching like 10 to the minus 4 solar masses per year towards the end of the AGV. Uh, every 10,000 to 100,000 years or so, depending on the mass of the star, uh, the helium burning shell uh, ignites in an explosive process called the helium shell flash or the thermal pulse. Uh, and this produces elements but also a lot of energy. As this energy is transported out in the star, the whole envelope is mixed, drenching up the newly synthesized <coughs> elements to the surface, and this is what is thought to drive the chemical evolution on the AGB. And indeed, we do see three different uh, um, spectral types of AGB stars. It seems to be consistent with this scenario. We have the M type stars with less uh, carbon than oxygen, intermediate S type stars, and carbon stars with more carbon. Uh, also on the AGB, there are very few known binaries just because it's so difficult to detect a faint companion next to this like 10,000 solar luminosity wind dust monster. So with ALMA in cycle zero, we observed this star, we have something up here several times by now already. We did the 12 and 13 CO, uh, and the initial aim of this project was to study the detached shell that you see here. And it's because we think that these detached shells are formed as part of the thermal pulse. So as the energy reaches the surface, you get an increase in the mass loss rate, and, and this, is, this causes eventually this shell as it snaps into the old wind. Uh, and we specifically wanted to study the isotopical ratios to see if they change as you move across from the shell to the inner wind. But then when we got the data, we uh, discovered this previously unknown spiral that we think is, is due to a, a binary companion. Uh, so, this spiral gives us even more information than we expected because the separation between the windings and the spirals are not constant. And it tells us that the expansion velocity has changed since the formation of the shell. And if we trace out the data, this is what we find. So this is the expansion velocity as a function of time. And these are different data points. So with this velocity uh, distribution, we put that into a model that simulates the formation of both the the shell and the spiral, and then we fit the results of that model to the data, and that gives us 
how the mass loss rate has changed, like before the formation of the shell, during the formation of the shell, and then after the formation of the shell. And this, this gives crucial constraints to this scenario that, that maybe the shell is formed as part of the thermal pulse. So this, this showed us like what you can do with binary ATV stars, the, the, the huge potential of ALMA to study binary ATV stars. And in cycle one, we applied for time and got time to do a small binary sample. And Andreas Meyer mentioned this already yesterday. So we have a sample of four uh, ATV stars that we know are binary. And for all the stars, we have um, there are result images of the binary parts. So I think that we have some idea at least of how the separation, what, what separation the different stars have. And so and, and we try to cover like an incisive range of separation to see how different separation binaries will, will influence the, the surface of material. And this one might have a close binary as well. And how to do this? Uh, I'm referring to Chestrin's talk in a <coughs> couple of talks ahead of mine. Um, yeah, like I said, the aim is to construct also like a reference sample, so uh, to enable us to, to infer binarity just from the shaping of the on the surface of the um, But this, and we also get the, for this sample, we also get the isotope ratios. So I would have, of course, like to be able to show you the results of this project today, but as so many other cycle one projects, it has not yet been observed. So I'm still waiting uh, for this to happen. But uh, so uh, for the rest of my talk, I will instead, uh, instead focus on this other aspect of what you can use the data for. So uh, isotopic ratios, why do you want to observe those? Well, because um, it gives strong constraints to the evolutionary models. I mean, you, can, you can try to figure out the formation of carbon stars, you can compare it to what you find in planetary nebulae. Um, it helps you constrain the different mixing processes that goes into these <coughs> models, etc. etc. So they usually constrain by observations of 12 CO and 13 CO, and before the projects that I'm going to show you now. It was mostly observed for only for nearby carbon source. But as all observers know, you have to when you do observations, you usually have to weigh like the sample size to the level of detail that you want to do. So we have two two studies where we have a large sample that we study in some detail in 60 AGV stars. We cover all chemical types, and with this we can constrain the evolution and nucleosynthesis when we compare the different types of stars. The drawback with this sample is that we don't know the binary fraction, just because what I told you before, that it's so difficult to detect companions around these stars. And with this data, since it's all single dish, you just get an average ratio across the surface that are open. So then we can compare this with what we get with the ALMA stars. So, so far only our Sartorius has been observed, but we will eventually get four more stars that we can compare to. Uh, these also cover all different chemical types, and here we get a result we can resolve the ratio across the CAC, so you can constrain the nuclear synthesis in that particular star. The drawback with this is that when you get all this detail, it can sometimes be difficult to disentangle what is causing what. And also, it's, of course, if you only have five stars, it's going to be difficult to draw any major general conclusions. No, I went the wrong way, sorry. So these are the results from the large sample. Uh, it's all low transition and single dish observations and we do digital radiative transfer including uh, radiation field from the dust and a lot of other stuff that you need to include. Uh, and the results, here are the different uh, <coughs> types of stars. So N-type stars are blue, so X-type stars are green and carbon stars are red. And we find that it's, we find a clear dependence on the C over ratio of the star, particularly if you ignore this part of the plot because it, it has some other limits and, and some chemically peculiar carbon stars in there. Uh, it becomes even more apparent if you look at the this thing here, which is just the histogram of the isotopic ratios. Um, you see that all the n-type stars have 
low values, and then the other ones spread out like this. I, I picked some surveys of PMs that I found just to, to compare with. I'm not sure how representative the sample is, but it's been claimed before that, that you cannot, that there's a clear distance between isotopic ratios on the ATV and in the PM phase. But now when we have also these N-type stars, it doesn't seem to be such a big difference. It seems that some of the carbon stars get really high ratios. And maybe that can be explained by something else. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the for the alma part of this, uh, these are things that you might not have seen before. So these are the 13 CO observations of our scriptories. Um, going from one side of the shell to the center velocity and out on the other side. Um, uh, and this is what it looks like if you come over with a 5 arc second beam. And on top of that, we have different models changing with, with different uh, present day isotopic ratios. As you can see, if you decrease the, the 13 CO abundance, essentially, you get a better fit. So in the present day wind, we find a ratio of 60 for the isotopic ratio. And then in the shell, we find a ratio of about 19. Although in the, the shell is very dropping, so there's a large range in the shell. Uh, so at first sight, this makes perfect sense. Like you would have, you would have uh, the shell forming in the thermal walls, and then you would have dredge up, and then you would have a higher value in the present day. But actually, if you look at the um, at the evolutionary models, the shell will, will form. Uh, at the same time as the dredge shell. So what you would expect is actually that the value in the shell and in the element would be the same. And also there's an atmospheric value which would be measured, that's measured in the 80s known publication. And from that one, that would be even further in the center of the star. And that is again low. So for this particular star, we conclude that uh, the isotopic, or the isotopic log ratios are not representative of the isotope evolution as the star evolves, but it's more likely influenced by other processes. So like for instance in the shell, you can have chemical fractionation um, <coughs> forming 13 CO from 12 CO because the, the shell is cool enough for this process to occur. And also we speculate that if I mean you could if the if the binary companion is not you could essentially have the electrical <coughs> CO is easily approached and associated by the stock companion, but we don't know that much about the companion, so we can't really say that. And that's the summary. So, four uh, non binary agent resources will be observed with Alman Cycle 1 to constrain the gravitational effects on the wind, and we will also take the result as the operations of these stars. And we have estimated these for a large mixed sample of agent stars, and there we find that, we, that this. The, the isotopal log ratio is representative of the isotope ratio and it follows, supports the evolutionary sequence, which is what we expect. But for our scriptorics, um, the it's more likely affected by external processes <laughs> and not, uh, the, not um, a proxy for the normal evolution of the star. And maybe isotopic ratios can be used to find binary components, but this, the new data will have to show this. So, to be continued. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so you know the game. You ask. She asked. Did you say the present day? Yes. Ask those. Yes. It means you're not talking about it. No, we're not talking about it. We're not talking about it. We're not talking well, when you say the present day calculations, yes. you mean the estimates of the uh, ratios from mm -hmm. the, 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 the weaker central part of the other, yes. including the spiral? Yes, I mean, it's just we, we just assume that it's that it has a certain width. So in the 13th year, you don't see the spiral. You don't see it. So, so but from the 12th year part, it's, it's there. Okay, but what, 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 what my question is, uh, uh, is obviously in this central part of the, of the 
the emperor, the optical depth is much smaller than in the other, which corresponds to a much higher mass of ray. So don't you think that pain may be that the passive display the role in this very low frequency of amount of the I mean, so if it's optically thin and you don't collect adequately the effect of the opacity, the, the, line, the, the line intensity ratio will no. be much higher than the yeah. optical thin. But it's not, it's not derived from the, from the intensity ratios. We actually model it taking the optical effects into account. So I'm very glad you touched upon the last course. I didn't have much time to talk about them, but of course when you import in groups of what's going on, especially when you don't understand them. And I would just like to point out that in CRX 618, uh, we have actually the first, probably the first measure of the isotope ratio in the very extended regions, which is about, so I've got into first and fifth and it's about 40. In the region regions, which are studied by Persian, it's about 20. And yeah. now in the SMA level, with your hands on our second resolution, we are finding the ratio in line. Yeah. Now, this is supposed to be a part of which object, and you have no idea how you can make such a low uh, frozen to carbon to this yeah. evaluation. That's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, oh, oh, okay, uh, let's move to the next speaker. We still have one hour of discussion, so we we'll have plenty of time.